Good evening, everyone. My name is Amit, and I'm talking to you from our center in Delhi, Ananda Center in Delhi. This evening, we will find draw some inspiration together with uh, the book that Swamiji has written from Living by Living Well. I sort of will split this reading in two parts, and then we will see how much we can discuss about that uh, this evening. He writes, if you are angry, it may be only because your idea of how things ought to have been has been outraged. Reflect on how many views can be held on any subject. Seek the rest point in yourself, midway between the pairs of opposites. Dwell there calmly. In inner stillness, you will be able to address every issue effectively. There's a funny thing we are talking here in this uh, reading about uh, how many different views that we hold and then we not only hold, we sort of assume that whatever view that we have is like the ultimate truth. So I'll tell you a funny story of a friend of mine and uh, she's from Canada and uh, most of her life she actually lived in Canada. So this was her first vacation she was going to spend in a different country and she in fact went all the way across uh, to uh, Vietnam. And uh, think about this, uh, all pretty much till she became an adult she has been in Canada. So everything that she looked around was uh, what she felt was how things are in the rest of the world. And Vietnam is a very interesting country, I have not been there myself but uh, whatever I have seen on documentaries. It's a beautiful place, but it's very culturally different than Canada. So she said the first time when she went to Vietnam, she was shocked. Shocked at what? She realized that 911 is not the number that you call in case of emergency. If you are living in India most of the time, you probably won't necessarily resonate with jo this joke also. But 911 is the Indian equivalent of 100, which we generally call if there is any sense of emergency. But isn't it so true? Like uh, whatever we feel like, how can 100 be not the emergency number? But some country probably is tuned into something entirely different. But somehow what we feel that, ha, huh, this is so obvious, we expect that that to be obvious for the entire globe. But and that expectation is sort of like a crux of many of the problems as Swamiji was talking about here. You know? He says, like, when you even look at a truth, there are many, many angles to it. Uh, we had discussed this earlier also, like, our own thoughts that we sometimes hold very close to our hearts, we keep changing them. We say, oh, 10 years ago, this is how I used to feel. Now I feel completely different. What changed? What changed is, yes, our perspective, our understanding, but that also means that once upon time something that we hold close to ourselves or we were very strong about our convictions doesn't really hold true today. What it actually tells us is just to take everything that we look at is with a pinch of salt. What we think that this is a final truth may not be in absolute sense very true. When I came to the spiritual path officially, if I may say, uh, I'm not a bad person, I don't think any of us are in that sense, but even the traits most of us possess, it's not that they're difficult to live in this world. But as I started formally, I also started becoming more gentle, more kind to the people. And initial times, I was also living in a Ananda community, and most of the people sort of resonated with this kind of living. So people were gentle, they were kind towards me, so I said, this is perfect. And then I would always was trying to learn spiritual principles and I said, yeah, the type of energy you put out, that's the same energy you attract. And I said, this is of course, henceforth my life is just going to be perfectly fine and normal and then as the most of the Hindi movies end, the life is going to be ever joyful henceforth. When I returned to India, then I also wanted to serve actively these teachings and I went out to the so-called world where and I wanted to share whatever I felt very resonant. And I realized that people weren't necessarily very kind and gentle to me. And I said, like, what? Why can't you be like that? Why are you so mean to me? And I realized that not one, not two, there are many of them. And 
portion of the time, like many months, I was very judgmental towards them. I thought this is the right way to live, the way I was living, being more kind, more gentle. And then there was this set of people, I wanted to share some beautiful things with them, but they were not receptive, not only receptive, they were being mean to me. Not even forget about being kindness. So I just put them, yeah, they're not there ready. But slowly, slowly I realized it is not that what I felt is right or wrong. It is something very important for me personally. There were some very important things, these people, when we had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, it's just that there was a completely different set of values that they put very close to their hearts. And they were putting energy to make sure that what is close to their heart is getting manifested. It's just that what I felt was close to my heart wasn't the same thing that we shared. And in that understanding, all of a sudden, I realized, okay, you know, we can both be very happy in our own spaces. There is another funny way to look at it. Hmm. They talk about this story huh, <clears throat> of looking at an elephant. Huh, there are five people were looking at an elephant. It was very small, but they were very close to the elephant. So one was looking at his feet, one was looking at the tail, one was looking at the, uh, the big, nice uh, ear of the elephant, and one was si sitting just very close to the, uh, the nose of the elephant. Or the... And then uh, they were asked to describe how does an elephant look? This is the first time they were looking at the elephant. Huh? So the person who was looking at the, the feet, they says, oh, elephant looks like a big uh, pillar. Then they asked the other person, do you think elephant looks like a pillar? He said, no, no, no. He looks like a big giant plate because he was looking at the ear. And he says, third person, do you think both of them are making sense? They says, absolutely not. He's a big hello, hollow pipe because he was looking at the trunk of the elephant. And then the fourth person was looking at the tail of the elephant. She's like, no, no, they are all got it all wrong. I know exactly how elephant looks like. Elephant looks like a bush, because he was looking at the bushy tail of the elephant. Who is right here and who is wrong? Everybody is right in their own perspective, right? But it is not a complete perspective. And what it means when we look at the truth like that? You know, till the point, Master says, we get enlightened, whatever we probably understand, that understanding will be a portion of the truth. It will be truth in its own, when it's looked from that perspective, but there could be very well possibility that another way to look at it. And this understanding actually brings us a very nice grounding. It doesn't mean we stop being very proactive towards our understanding, that question our own understanding, but also, it gives enough space for other existence. People who come and then present to us with complete different uh, uh, opinions or points of view, it doesn't become like a threat to us, but it more presents to us as a conundrum. Now, then we say, okay, how do I bring these two into a common reality? Now, how do I make the bushy tail and then the giant... Uh, uh, pillar like elephant into an elephant. So we start to expand our definition of elephant to include both of them. And you see this is a good direction because as we continue to take this direction what is going to happen is eventually we will have a complete picture of the elephant. And that's the journey. And till that point and we will reach there that is a journey to self-realization keeping in this mind no that is the awareness that we don't want to lose every time any time is that whatever we feel like um, i strongly believe it that's the time when we can oh oh that could basically ring a bell and saying ah oh, i probably have to be a little bit more careful about what i'm going to say from here mm. and this as i mentioned like also brings into a very nice way to accept people for what they are. Uh, there is a great uh, saintly person, uh, Ramdas, and he talks about converting people into trees. When we go to a forest or in a park, there are many different types of trees we, we see, isn't it? And we don't judge them because one is thorny and one is like beautiful flowers. We may have preferences, but either of them, uh, we just accept for what it is and we appreciate for what they are. 
It could be a cactus, it could be a beautiful rose flower, it could be a big tall tree or one like a banyan tree. We look each of them for what they are and appreciate it and move forward, isn't it? And he said like, but the same thing can you apply when it comes to human beings. We want every human being to be just like we are. No? I wanted everyone to be just a kind and compassionate because I preferred it that way. I wanted, I was resonating with that truth. And any time I see a thorny man or a person who is basically more like a cactus or a fire which is burning me, I say like, I can't handle this. And I just uh, refuse that. But no, we don't embrace cactus. We appreciate it from the distance. So that wisdom also be, has to be from ourselves. But you see, it is not coming from a disdain or a judgment that, okay, we have to eradicate cactus from this planet to make it beautiful. No. We just have to understand the texture of it and appreciate for what it is and use our own judgment to basically when we deal with that kind of a tree, that kind of a personality. In Buddhism, uh, they, there is something called as Kuan, they say. Huh? And this, what, what, these are like just a statement of truths, but these statements of truths don't actually make sense to the minds. Hmm? One of the Kuans, what does it say? It says, if you find the Buddha, kill him. If you find the Buddha, it says, kill him. What does it actually mean? And it is really not uh, as interesting if I explain it, but uh, I invite you to take it in your own uh, contemplation at any point in time. When we are searching for truth, that is like looking for Buddha. Hmm. But as uh, we were talking about the example of elephant, the moment we feel that, oh, I've sort of understood it, hmm. that's a catch. Because our understanding most of the time is not entire complete. We probably have just touched the bush of the elephant or we probably just looked at the uh, feet of the elephant. It's not yet complete. And those like the moment you feel that you are very close, that's the time you say you are not. Uh, Master also, actually, in a very confusing way, he told, uh, who is enlightened? No. Master says, no, you can't say it like that. He says, like, well, then how, how do you know? Then to that our question, because you see, these kind of a questions come from mind. What the master answers is, uh, if you think you are not enlightened, you are not enlightened. And if you think you are enlightened, you are not enlightened. Interesting, isn't it? This is not something that the mind can comprehend. Huh? And that is what the Quad is also trying to say. Take it with a pinch of salt. And especially when you feel too certain about it, take it even more carefully. Be even more alert. And this is what will take care of the first part of the reading. It's like, don't be angry. Because the moment you're angry, you're attached to something which is basically a partial truth. So just take a step back and let look at the bigger picture and that will bring us to a nice comfortable place from which place we can appreciate for whatever it is. Okay, That brings us to the second and important part of uh, this reading. He says, seek the rest point in yourself, midway between the pairs of opposites. Dwell there calmly in inner stillness you will be able to address every issue effectively. This is a very fundamental uh, teaching and then one of the very important virtue that we talk about on the spiritual path, which is, we always heard this word called be even-minded and cheerful under all circumstances, isn't it? Sounds very beautiful, isn't it? Being even-minded and cheerful under all circumstances. What are the all circumstances could be? It could be very joyful. It could be very difficult. Difficult. In spite of whatever the circumstances bringing to you, you choose to become even-minded and cheerful. Uh, earlier when uh, we, I started learning these teachings and practicing, I heard this term over and over, you know, in our path, Master's path, Paramahansa Yogananda's path, and also as it is exemplified by Swamiji, Swami Kriyanandaji, it's not the austerity in its extremity is never encouraged, or it's, like it's not relevant also. He said you don't need to give up uh, the joys that the world offers you or anything, 
just don't restrict yourself or don't define yourself by those joys hmm? and then they would also use these terms like you can enjoy things which is offered to you but enjoy them with the joy of God ah. and I was very relieved first of all when I heard that because uh, it just gave a sense of freedom because I knew there are many things I like simple simple things like some food items some things to visit friends and then some good things as also visit beautiful places so it's like don't have to remove but there's a way to enjoy them and that is the joy of God while I was relieved when I tried to practice it I never quite realized ki, how do I do it what does that even mean to enjoy it with the joy of God because I understand enjoyment I can enjoy eating like a good food I enjoy it but what is it that I'm going to do differently so that it now becomes as a joy of God Ah, and that is the crux of what Swamiji is also inviting in this reading. He's like, don't sway to the extreme. He said, seek the midpoint. Midpoint in between. You know, when joy comes, we all have experienced joy in our lives and we have experienced sorrow in our lives. Even when we talk about being even minded and cheerful, that doesn't mean that cheerfulness isn't the exuberant joy that uh, we sometimes see like as a bum bubbling with joy. How can we expect someone to be joyful when some difficult situation is happening to him? It's not possible, isn't it? Then what does it actually mean to be at the center when the opposites are also pulling? We say that many a times that we like some things, isn't it? We like to go this place. Why? Because it brings a lot of joy. I like to spend time with my friends. Why? Because that brings me a lot of joy. Huh? And we try to, we, we don't like a few things. We say like, I avoid going there because it brings my energy down. It drains me. Or these kind of a situations when I get into, it is troublesome. We don't like it. Huh? Now, circumstantially, if we are offered, if life offers, we ask one possibility over the other, uh, we can take precautions, but the moment, let's say, a joyful occasion happens, what is our tendency? We generally like it. We like it, we enjoy it, but as that situation starts withering down, for example, you are with the friend and the friend is trying to leave, the joyful event, there's a sensation of, oh, it is getting going to get over, isn't it? We try to hold on to it. Can't this last forever? On the other extremities, when something like a very disdainful or something difficult situations, what is our tendency? We try to sort of reject it, like push it away. Can't you just disappear from here? Can't you just disappear from here? Huh. And both of these, like one which is trying to hold on and the other one is trying to push away. Huh. Both of these are kind of not useful traits, you see, because life is there anyone, if you are one of those who have never experienced pain in life, then maybe you are wasting your time listening to this talk. Same thing, if you are basically the one who have never experienced joy in this life, it's also not possible. These kind of things, life, as the spiritual text say, brings both of us together. We will have our share of joys, we'll share, have our share of difficult situations, it's going to go up and down, pleasurable and pain. The two opposites come in. If we decide that we are going to enjoy the pleasurable such situations in our life and we are going to resent all the things which bring us pain, we just mark that half of the time we are going to be difficult in our lives. So what is the alternative? We say like don't seek for any pleasure or pain outside of yourself but instead just stay at the center. Just stay at the center, meaning don't be pulled by it when some good things happen. Don't refuse when something which basically brings you a little bit of pain or difficult situations when it comes to them. Stop refusing, stop attaching. That becomes now our work. Why would we do something like that? Hmm. There is another story that comes to mind. Huh? This is from the sage Vyasa's life. Uh, there, the, Sage Vyasa was also, I think, Sage Vyasa, but one of the saints, I would say. 
and then he was also a disciple of Krishna. Krishna was on the other side of the river and then these uh, many of uh, Krishna's students, they were trying to get some cottage cheese for him according uh, through across the river. Uh, the river was to Yamuna was uh, flooded with lots of water so they couldn't pass. So they went to this uh, saint and he was sent so they knew that he has lots of powers. He said, uh, we have to take this cottage cheese to Krishna. Uh, why don't you help us by asking river to just create a passage so that we can pass safely. The saint says, sure I can do that but before Krishna I am hungry. Why don't you give some of the cottage cheese to me? This is okay, what kind of, they inside their mind they say like what kind of a saint is this? We are saying we are taking this for Krishna and then he is asking that for himself. This, he didn't mind, he just ate and he ate quite a bit of it. So like this guy is just too much. They didn't say because he was a saint after all. But then when he was quite well fed, he got up and then he went to Yamuna and says, Yamuna, if I have not eaten any cottage cheese, divide up and part. And Yamuna parted. These guys were just, okay, he ate half of the cottage cheese that we got and Yamuna still listens to him anyway. They were not concerned, so they just crossed and they went. And then finally Krishna was there, so they said, Lord, we brought a lot of cottage cheese for you, but uh, only half of his remaining, please have it. What does Krishna say? Oh, but I am actually already full. He says, what? How are you full? So says, the guy on the other side of the river, he fed me so much. Now this story, when I first heard, I felt very sweet. It's a very sweet story, isn't it? The and then I also resonated more with actually these guys who want to make that offering to Krishna. And then I also couldn't really understand what necessarily uh, the saint was doing. But that's precisely, I think, what is important to know for today. It's like, what was he doing that made Krishna eat that food? You know, if I ask you, if we have to ask ourselves that later on, Today we'll have our dinner at some point. If instead of we eating, we want to eat, make Krishna eat that food, how will we do it? You know, very difficult question to answer, isn't it? But there's a very simple answer to this question. And the simple answer to question is also lies in the things, where is Krishna? Hmm? We talk about ourselves, our definition of ourselves, that we are soul, meaning we are part of all that is. The divinity which is in every atom of that creation, isn't it not within us also? And isn't it not within us at this very point in time? And if that is true, every molecule that comes and goes into this mouth, when we feed ourselves, not just this evening, but every time, we are always feeding Krishna. But our mind, our attention is never to that. You see, we eat that food and somehow that food gets transformed and it becomes what we call that our body. When we feed that intelligence, when what is Krishna? Krishna was a representation. He was a messenger of what we call as an omnipresent spirit. The same spirit which at this very moment also abides in each one of us. So not a single time when we feed ourselves, we are not feeding Him. But it's only our mind tries to tell, oh, but I don't know how to do it. Instead of giving that thought a lot of energy, can we give this thought a little bit of energy? And then when we put that food into our mouth, think that what we are feeding is that intelligence. That intelligence is going to take care of converting that food into energy. The energy that sustains me now and all the time. And when we bring that attention all of a sudden now, we are back to the center. What is our center? When we are in touch with that presence within ourselves. And in there, we hold the capacity now, we can look the drama of this life, the pleasures and pains, whatever life is bringing at ourselves, 
we have a capacity to look at it, participate it with all our, our courage, all our interest. Hmm? Not losing that center though. Because from here, we have the capacity to navigate as life brings us to the situations. And that navigation is not ego-driven. That navigation is not driven by what I like and what I don't like. It is just that what life wants us to do. You see, if life is bringing us pleasurable situation, then what do we do? We just try and control our tendency to get attached to that so that when that situation is evaporated, we have the grace to let it go. The same thing when the life brings some things which is so-called painful situation, we stop the resistance within ourselves. Attune ourselves to the flow of life and that is possible when we are at our center. Joy to you.